ex-Muslim atheist, Nas hopes to bring to light the myriad issues facing ex-Muslims. Let's welcome Nas Ismail. No worries. Hello, California Free Thought Day. How's everyone doing? Cal, it's Free Thought Day for everyone except Dave. And you as well. So, my name's Naz Ishmael, and I'm an ex-Muslim and co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America. So let's go a little bit about why ex-Muslim first. We often get asked that question, why ex-Muslim? Why can't you just say atheist? or secular humanist, or secular Muslim, or something like that. The answer to this question lies in how people who leave Islam and atheists in general are perceived in Muslim circles. What happens is you get told, people don't really leave Islam. Shh. It's a new and Western innovation. Or that people only leave because they want it to party and drink and have sex and eat bacon, I suppose. The idea that people leave Islam because of moral or intellectual reasons is rarely, if ever, considered. Now this irks me quite a bit, since the vast majority of ex-Muslims I've had the pleasure of interacting with have been far more informed about Islam than actual Muslims. People who leave Islam face ostracization from families and in some case emotional or physical abuse or worse. Until we can live in a society where a person is free to voice that simple opinion that they no longer hold any supernatural beliefs, we will continue to use the term ex-Muslim. Until people are no longer killed in various parts of the world simply for declaring their non-belief, we will continue to use this term ex-Muslim. And I look forward to the day when we don't have to. Ex-Muslims face the dubious honor of being despised from multiple sides. On one hand, you've got Muslims who are offended by our very existence. And then you have the fact that ex-Muslims even though we are atheists, we are skeptics, agnostics, freethinkers, and such, we look Muslim. Which means the rising incidences of bigotry being faced by Muslims affects us directly, too. But you know what? Even if it didn't, we should all care about it. These are our fellow human beings, and they need our support. To that end, I have a somewhat unorthodox solution. Stop using the term Islamophobia. It makes no sense. And let me tell you why. Let's take a look at two situations. Situation one, a hypothetical hijab-wearing woman is verbally assaulted on the street, quite viciously, by someone who has never met her before and is only doing so because she's visibly Muslim. Just keep that mental image up there for a moment. We got situation number two. I'm having coffee with a practicing Muslim who's never met an atheist before. And while we sip our macchiatos, I mention that Islam has made the lives of women horrible. It treats them as second-class citizens, considers them to have deficient intelligence, imposes a heavy-handed and utterly pointless modesty doctrine upon them, and considers them to be completely at fault for any sexual advances, unwanted or otherwise. So what do these situations have in common? The word Islamophobia would often be used to describe both of them. How does this make any sense? On one hand, you have a clearly xenophobic and bigoted attack on a human being. On the other is a calm and rational discussion over coffee that may or may not have offended a person. Those points I made about over coffee, by the way, I'd be happy to cite any one of them. Using the same term to describe both a rational discussion and a bigoted attack is an insult to every victim of bigotry. It's an insult to every Muslim, every person who's perceived to be Muslim, every person who just happens to be walking by and thought of as Muslim. It's an insult to every one of them. I prefer to use the term anti-Muslim bigotry to describe this sort of hateful act, and I encourage you to use it as well in favor of Islamophobia. This term Islamophobia is used to stifle free speech in a very underhanded way, by putting people like us into the same boat as people who would attack someone on the street. Stop using it. Stop contributing to the muzzling of America. Another thing I'd like to address is cultural relativism. 
There's something that really bugs me about someone saying that a group of people simply just does things that way. Or it's their culture. When, something, when it comes to something that clearly works against humanistic principles or even basic human rights. To say that Muslim women don't need the same rights as women from anywhere else in the world because of their religion or their culture is two steps short of racist. How can anyone say that a man who kills his daughter because of honor should be dealt with differently because of his culture? Yet this is starting to happen. There was a recent court case in the UK where a lawyer was attempting to use uh, the accused's religion as a defense. And this person was being accused of killing someone as an honor killer. It's just madness. And this is happening now in 2016. We must not allow this to happen. Everyone must be treated equally under the rule of law. And you know what? This right here is the only rule of law that applies in this great nation. I'm holding up a copy of the Constitution, FYI. How dare anyone, how dare anyone say that these people aren't good enough to meet the same standards as the rest of us? How dare you delegate an entire group of people to a status that is less than that of another human being? Human rights and humanistic principles belong to all of us, and they apply to everyone equally, regardless of their cultural background. Either we are all equal or none of us are. Thank you. I wasn't running off. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. We got 10 oh. minutes for questions. Yes. Hit it. No questions? Hi. Have you had the opportunity to debate people like that? I don't know if I'm See, here's the thing. Uh, Reza Aslan is who you're referring yeah, right. to. Um, actually, after his uh, initial CNN, I don't know exactly what to call it, um, my colleagues Sarah and Mohammed wrote a response to a lot of his stuff. Now, one of the things is um, we don't do a lot of debates, per se. Because our point of view is raising awareness about our plight. And that when we get into debates, it just, it's just this circle of, well, you know, according to this part of this scripture, insert mental gymnastics here. We're beyond that. We're, we're trying to cause, like, we're trying to make actual change happen. And I feel like from our perspective and what ex-Muslims in North America is doing, debates don't necessarily help us in that sense. Yes. I wanted to know more about the ex-Muslims that you connect with mm -hmm. throughout the United States. Who are they? Are they in groups? Are they solitary? I, I'd be happy to answer that question. So the answer is all of the above, right? Ex-Muslims are just like anyone else. We are not a monolith. Um, I come from Toronto where our, we, I think we have the largest ex-Muslim group in the world right now, 100 and something or other people. and. Within our communities, and I was giving a talk yesterday, if you go onto our website, exmna.org, we have a little thing in our, in our About Us page where we highlight the diversity of our group. Currently, we have uh, ethnic backgrounds of, I think, 32 different national uh, backgrounds right now. So we, we are very diverse from that sense, but also our diversity falls into people who are very, very much into the religion, very fundamentalist. We had former uh, Muslim Student Association presidents, former imams, things like that. But we also have people on the other side of the spectrum who were just generally not very religious and didn't really have a space to know what to do next. And that's what ex-Muslims of North America offers, the what next. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, towards Muslims. Yeah. Um, but I'm concerned about Sharia law. I'm concerned about that uh, that is a problem in our country. But, but I don't want to be associated with the religious right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, question. Yes. <laughs> your answer. Your form of a question, please. But. Really, the answer to that is discussion and talking about it openly. Because a lot of when you were saying a lot of the religious right, when they're, when they're referring to Sharia and things like this, it's just I heard this one thing about that, and now I'm going to yell it out. That's not the approach we should be taking. A, a lot of us don't even know what Sharia is, and let, let's be honest, Sharia is not going to happen in the U.S. Be realistic. 
it's it's not gonna happen, right? It just yeah. So I understand you, there are concerns about it, and really the best way to alleviate your concerns is to talk to people about it. Uh, talk to Muslims. Talk to, talk to ex-Muslims who will give you a bit of a more I would like to say unbiased opinion. Some would say biased. Yes, I'll be with you in a second. Mm -hmm. So, what is your definition of Islamophobia? That, because what you, what you said doesn't really jive with. Well, here's a, let me give you the definition of Islamophobia according to the Council for American Islamic Relations. Their website tells you that the definition is an irrational fear of Islam and Muslims. Islam and Muslims. Irrational. There's a difference here, right? But my key point here is Islam and Muslims. One is an ideology, like you mentioned, the other is people. So my main point I was trying to get across is you can criticize ideas. You can criticize ideologies. People have rights. Ideas do not. Right? right? Okay. So based on that definition, it makes sense, but the Webster's definition is just the ideology. So Here's a, that's, the, that, that's exactly the problem, isn't it? There's too many definitions. So it brings me back to my initial point. When there's so many definitions, where does it make sense? Yes. Northern Europe, um, where specifically? Well, Ex-Muslim North America, we deal with North American issues, so officially I don't have a position on that. That being said, think about the difference in the way immigration and refugee status takes place in U.S. and Canada compared to a lot of Europe. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the U.S. Uh, compa uh, policies compared to Canadian ones, so I'll tell you a little bit more in that sense. There's a higher standard necessary to be able to uh, uh, come into these countries as immigrants than, there, than the standards required in the U.K., which ends up be leading to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's about education at the end of the day. The average immigrant, the average refugee coming into the U.S. and Canada tend to be more educated and therefore more likely to integrate than they would be in the U.K. Yes. Well, uh, a lot of what we do, um, we started off initially as a community building organization. So uh, a lot of the outreach we do is we reach out specifically to ex-Muslims in campuses and things like this. Because up until now, there hasn't been a space for people who have left Islam. Not people who are questioning and debating, but people who have left and gone to that point. So that was our initial thing. And now what we, are, we advocate for is uh, we advocate against blasphemy laws. We are part of the coalition against the blasphemy laws. Um, we are working on a few projects I can't talk about just now, but over the next few weeks and months, they'll be quite apparent. So please keep an eye out on our social media and our websites. Yes. Is a death sentence for to leave the religion? Scripturally. But people might pass on that? It is a possibility, but Realistically speaking, the average American Muslim is not going to actually do that. The, the r more realistic concern, like let's say out of, out of 10,000, maybe, no, 10,000 isn't even, out of a million, that might happen once. But the real concern is what about the others? What about the ones who face abuse on a daily basis, who are told that they're stupid or dumb for not believing? who are told that they can't go out with their friends because their friends are ruining them. They need to sit at home and read the Quran. It's more about what everything short of being killed, all the horrible things that can happen to you. I, I just read Princess Life Behind the Veil, so that's like really... Now, the, you're, you're referring to Muslim nations who operate with scripture as the basis for their government. So that's a problem. Again, that's one of the reasons why we exist, because more of us that are out there, the more of us that are talking about these issues, hopefully we're able to stop that from happening. I just need you to repeat the question that keeps coming oh. up. Answer. I just brought it up to you. No worries. A couple more questions, please. So I have a question. Yes. It has to do with ISIS. Okay. Um, now ISIS has a whole different interpretation of what Muslim is and, and how they carry this out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, as, how do you see what they're trying to do as opposed to what you're 
Well, here's the thing. Um, the question was um, about ISIS and their interpretation of the Quran and stuff. Well, the thing is, everybody interprets it differently. This is a core problem with religion in general. There is no such thing as objective morality. It's all about how you read it and you apply it. So is their interpretation any more or less real than the interpretation of a peaceful Muslim? The answer is it doesn't matter. It's just a book. The re reality of the situation is what matters. Yes? Uh, so we see a lot of uh, ex-Muslims in Western countries or Muslims, mm -hmm. right? So how do you see, I, I'm saying this because I often say that Islam is like sort of bulletproof resistance to reform. Right? So sort of influencing the, uh, the culture in say Muslim countries, Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. Like if ex-Muslims are able to come out or talk or you know, bring up the issue. Mm -hmm. So um, the question was, uh, how is it affecting uh, ex-Muslims in countries uh, outside of the West? Is there any hope for it to change, any positive change in those countries? Yes, there is a lot of hope, actually. And there's, uh, there's a lot of good news been coming out over the past few mo years. Of course, I mean, there is a lot of bad news as well, right? Uh, take Bangladesh, for example. There are a lot of horrible things happening to our colleagues out in, in Bangladesh. And the reason that's happening is because there is more vocal people out there. And that, I would argue, is a good thing. Because the more that are out there, the more that are talking about this, they're able to affect the change in that way. And even in a country as, as deeply ingrained into Islam as Saudi Arabia, you're starting to see change. There's a, a, the religious police, the, I think they're called Society for Prevention of uh, Vice and Promotion of Virtue. Now, they're, they're, known, um, they're known as the Mutawa. They're, their job is really to enforce Islam. They're not really cops. That's what they do. Recently, um, they had some of their powers taken away, which is, is huge in Saudi Arabia, right? It's a small step, but it is, they are moving towards a, a more liberal kind of reform. And this is happening in other parts of the world as well. In Iran, you know, there's the women who have been uh, campaigning against hijab for a long time. Recently, there was a really cool campaign where men were wearing hijab in order to support uh, their wives. And that, it, it was great. All these pictures are coming out. So there is hope. And... I think we, are, we have to lead the battle from here. It, it, it's, a, it's a battle of the mind and visibility. And we have to lead that by being examples. And even in countries like Pakistan, actually, there is a very large underground atheist uh, population in Pakistan. It's just that they don't have any representation. That's the problem. And I mean, because when they come out and try to represent themselves, well, yes. Oh, sorry. We have no more time for questions. But thank you so much, guys. Thank <laughs> you.